Hey, what's up, folks? Welcome to another edition of the Winning Drive, as Coach calls it, the champ, the championship winning drive, or the winning championship drive, whichever way you want to put it. All right, we're having a good time on the show today. Of course, I am Lifetime Longhorn Rod Babers, joined by Lifetime Longhorn C.J. Vogel. He's the man in the know, especially when it comes to recruiting, uh, especially when it comes to all things Texas Longhorn. And, of course, we're joined by the coach, a former high school coach at Rotan, Brownwood, uh, uh, Burnett, Bur- Belton, Capel also played college football at Abilene Christian, coached there on multiple stints as well, uh, five seasons on the staff over at the University of Texas in multiple different roles as well. He is a very accomplished man. Now you can find his work over at ShipleyRanches.com. Usually I wear my Shipley Ranches uh, hat, but I don't have it on today. Uh, Coach Bob Shipley joining us. What's going on, Coach? How you doing? Doing good, man. Doing good. Have, we've got a little rain out here in Abilene, man. <laughs> That's reason to celebrate. Oh, yeah. No yeah, doubt. A little, no rain, doubt. little rain and, and, you know, people paying thousands and thousands of dollars for houses and rooms for the eclipse coming up a week from today. It's going to be raining. Yeah. It's going to be raining. <laughs> hey, they, they don't get care. A check. Refund. They don't care. I actually, that's crazy. You bring that up. I was recently in uh, Idaho visiting with my in-laws and I actually, there were some people up there. They were talking about coming down, renting property down here in central Texas or close to it. Cause there is, yeah, apparently in, in the sight line, whatever it is, uh, they can come down here and watch the eclipse and they're going to pay big money for it too. So you're right, man. It's, it's, Hey, if you, if you can do it, if you can make some money off of it, hey, make that bread off of it, man. Are you going to be interested in the clips, Coach? Is there, Are you going to be down there watching it? I, I'll be I'll be right in the center of it. Jordan's got a ranch down down in uh, in that area, Central Texas area. That um, we're going to meet some friends down there and have have a little camp out, have a little good time. I'm just hoping that we can see the dang thing. It's, it's just. You know, if it's the sun, if, if the sun's not out, it's just going to like get dark and then it's going to get light again. I, I don't know how exciting that's going to be. But I'll, I'll, I'll be doing, um, I'll be doing Monday show uh, post eclipse. There you go. Yeah. From the Broken O Ranch in Central Texas. Oh, Beautiful. I've, yeah. I've done it there before. Remember, you know, like the big. The big like a windmill vein hanging up on the wall and all that. I, I've done the show from there a couple of times. Nice. I can't wait to get the breakdown, Coach, of the Eclipse. I might because we gonna. I might miss it. You know what I mean? I got a lot going on. I might miss it. I don't know if my man C.J. Bogle knows about uh, the Eclipse or knows about any of those uh, those very uh, big time issues, but he knows about football. He knows about recruiting. How you doing, C.J.? What's going on, brother? Hey, I'm good. I'm ready for uh, for the eclipse to come. That way, we can give you another one of those astro- uh, astronomy classes. You know, whenever <laughs> you come out, talk about the stars, the sky, the moon, and everything that goes involved with that. But that'll be fun. I'm excited for it. Yeah, see, CJ's a renaissance man. He can talk about astronomical uh, anomalations, uh, anomalies, and all that kind of stuff. Anomalations. <laughs> Yeah, I made that up for y'all. So I made up a word. There you go. But that can happen on uh, the winning drive as well. We can do that. Uh, all right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we'll take your uh, any of your questions, and we'll also get into your comments. You can put that in the chat, of course. Super chats. We'll put that at the front of the line. We'll answer all your super chats. My man, uh, CJ's going to get us a recruiting update here uh, momentarily. Uh, we'll also get into a couple of topics. ESPN is ranking uh, the best players right now in college football at certain positions for the 2024 season. There's some Longhorns getting some love. Uh, so we'll dive into it and review that, have that discussion. I think it'll be a fun one um, because the Longhorns are getting uh, a lot of love, a lot of positions there. They have players that are ranked among the best in the country. Uh, that should be the case. So we'll discuss it. Uh, we'll also get into some other topics. There is uh, Matt Miller, who does great work uh, as a draft analyst. He actually has a, a seven round mock draft. He went deep, deep, deep deep down the rabbit hole. Uh, so we'll talk about what Longhorns he's got uh, d- being drafted in his seven round mock draft, how many Longhorns he's got going overall. Uh, that'll be a fun topic of conversation as well. So we'll get into that coming up a little bit later on in the show. Like I said, hit us up with all of your comments, your chats, or your questions. We'll answer as many of them as we can. Uh, let's first uh, hear from my man, CJ. CJ, is there anything going on in the recruiting world that we need to be updated on? 
Well, aside from April 6th coming up this uh, this upcoming weekend, that's going to be one of, if not your largest Texas recruiting weekends on campus. Obviously, KJ Lacey coming down, racing Guillory the commit out of Alito in the 2026 class. But on top of that, Kelshawn Johnson, Khalid Lockett, John Mills, Jamie French. Uh, and you can add one more big name to that group, and that's Jordan Davison, the five-star running back out of modern day in California. He will be coming in. This is an important visit for Texas. Of course, uh, the official visit later in June is going to be big for the Longhorns' chances and reeling in another five star prospect from the West Coast, but Jordan Davidson was just at Michigan and Ohio State this past weekend, in which it looked like Ohio State gained some momentum with a few crystal balls being inputted for the Buckeyes uh, with Jordan Davidson. So big opportunity for Texas to kind of halt that momentum and get back on the roll of their own here. Uh, that'll be interesting this weekend. And then another one, uh, our, our good friend Jerry Hamilton actually just texted us in the group chat, uh, but Nick Townsend, the tight end out of Decay in the 2025 class, just ran 10-9 at 215 pounds. Uh, that is the tight end prospect who is uh, wow. also expected in on campus this weekend at April 6th, as well as an official visit for June 21st through 23rd. So a lot going on, and it's really going to start building up after this weekend because April 13th, another strong visitor week, and then the, the spring game on the 20th. Uh, recruits will be all over campus the next three uh, Saturdays. Uh, that's interesting. So is there uh, a particular um, focus that you think the Longhorns need to have in recruiting at this time, whether it be position or whether it be a certain player that you think should be a priority for the Longhorns in recruiting? Well, it's certainly interesting now. I, I think they did this by design, having KJ Lacey on campus for April 6th, April 20th, and then his official visit later in June you get that idea that he's going to be the guy Texas kind of revolves their recruiting pitch around, at least to me. And this was something that KJ mentioned to me when I saw him last week at the Elite, Elite 11 is, yeah, the staff gave me a few guys to go talk to and recruit in favor for Texas, and I'm going to go do that. I want some talented wide receivers to throw to. I want some really big, you know, humans in front of me to block for me. Uh, so that's kind of where I think things are going right now. Of course, on the offensive side of the ball in this class, you have tight end Emory Winston in the fold. But aside from that, it, it's wide open. And so to see this list, which is probably about 25 to 30 names long at the moment, uh, it's really going to revolve around how much work can you put in with the big names coming into campus, as well as KJ Lacey returning to campus again as your guy uh, to really start turning the, the waters a little bit for this 2025 class. Oh, yeah. And Texas getting Lacey on campus is huge because he was at Auburn a week ago. And we know Auburn, Ole Miss, and Oregon are going to continue to hunt around with KJ Lacey to try and flip him from his Texas verbal at the moment. Now, good stuff there, CJ. Appreciate that. Um, yeah, and speaking of, uh, you know, quarterbacks, the like quarterbacks like to have great receivers to throw to. Uh, the Longhorns got a, a nice batch of receivers on campus right now. And when we get into the ESPN rankings of different positions, I want to start with those wide receivers. Just say heads up to my man, Matthew. That is a great place to start. But one question before we get started and kind of get into some of the questions in the chat. Uh, guys, keep them going. I see my man AJ, AJJ underscore sports uh, already got a couple of questions out there and he's always had a couple of good ones. But let me ask you this. We've heard a lot about spring practice. We've heard a lot about different players who are trending in the right direction. Um, we've heard a lot of different reports about positions, how deep they are. Um, is there something you haven't heard about that you want to hear more of or someone you haven't heard about yet? Uh, haven't been uh, reported on yet that you want to hear more about, that you're expected to hear more about. What are we four padded practices in, six total practices in, um, small sample size, but I mean, it's spring ball. So you're in the meat of it now. Um, is there something that you would like to uh, hear more about uh, in terms of these reports coming out of spring practice that you haven't heard more about or a person or a player specifically that you want to hear more about? To me, it's the linebacking room. And I know that the big question mark has been the, the defensive line and, you know, will Texas be able to replace Devondre Sweat and Byron Murphy? Uh, I, I think that's been a topic that we've covered pretty well. Maybe is the answer. Uh, you'll probably feel a little bit better after the portal window uh, in two weeks. But, you know, what kind of strengths are you looking at in that linebacking room? You know what you have with Anthony Hill? David Bendis kind of stepped up into that leadership role. But will you see 
you know, movement with Mo Blackwell moving inside to get some reps. I've heard that he's gotten a little bit of looks there early this spring. Uh, will Leonga Lafau push the two of those older guys uh, to take some, some reps from them? Uh, will you take Anthony Hill out of the middle to free him up off the edge or in the middle or even, you know, as an off-ball edge rusher? You know, who, who knows? But at the moment, I want to hear more from that linebacking room because – Losing Jalen Ford, that's big. You know, it, it's big because not only he was a great athlete, he's a great football player, but he's he's very smart in that middle of the defense. And he has a lot of experience and a lot of snaps under his belt there to kind of pick apart what he's seeing in the passing game, which we know it was his strength uh, as a Longhorn. So I, I'm looking at the, that linebacking spot as one that I'm looking at and saying, all right, I need to know a little bit more before I start feeling really comfortable about that front seven in its entirety. It's good stuff. What about you, Coach? Any position or player specifically, even area that you want to hear more information about this so far uh, this spring you haven't heard enough about you're really interested in? Well, I think the linebacker, uh, like CJ was talking about, linebacker is going to be really interested. interesting to me. Uh, Leon LaFau is, is a guy with uh, Blackshire, I, and I, I want to see how those guys – if one of those guys is going to be able to be that middle linebacker guy, you know, in our front, but um, you know me, man, the thing I'm excited about and we've been talking about him, but I haven't seen him yet are those receivers and, and, and how all that's going to work in uh, with replacing, uh, you know, two guys, uh, three guys possibly, uh, you know, going in the draft. And um I really want to see. I haven't. Uh, I haven't been able to catch a practice yet, but I'm going to. But uh, you know, Isaiah Bond and Matthew Golden, Silas Bolden. Those are guys I want to. I want to see with my own eyes, and and see how they're uh, how well they're teaming up with the quarterbacks. You know, uh, mm-hmm. how well they're picking up the offense. Uh, you know, I think you got to work them in slow. But that's that's that along with. Um, you know, the running back situation is uh, – I, I want to see a, a, a little bit two back you're always touting. Hey, uh, that pony, baby. Yeah, I, yeah, I want to see that, and I want to see how they're going to use, uh, you know, Savion and some of those guys uh, in the uh, – that, that aren't necessarily going to be starters, but how they're going to plug them in and get get the ball in their hands. Jaden Blue and mm. Baxter yeah. and those guys. I'm, I'm excited about those, those guys. It's not really a question. It's just more of a – excitement to see you know how well those guys are going to plug in to to the offense for the 24th season yeah no i agree with uh cj about the linebackers i think that's a good uh place i'll go with um tight end i want to hear more about the tight ends i've heard you know that they like what they see out of Amari night black um but i want to hear more about how gunner helm looks uh, i'd like to hear more about juan davis i'd like to hear more about that group overall um, and what's materializing with the tight ends because you're so deep everywhere, deep at running back, deep at wide receiver. Um, I wonder if the tight ends, which Sark loves, he's a big fan of having a tight end on the field, 12 personnel, 11 personnel. I wonder if potentially the personnel grouping could fall out of favor just a little bit this year um, with the other you know, deeper positions you have and the weapons you have on offense. So I'll throw that out there. In addition to what CJ said about the linebackers, I like that group too. Um, all right. I know we got some questions, uh, over in the chat, so we'll get to as many of the uh, questions as we can. I know we got some good ones. Um, but first, before we even get started, I'd love to uh, give a shout out to our sponsors. Uh, we appreciate all of their support. First, of all, Flat Creek Estate Winery. Um, we appreciate them. Flat Creek Estate Wine uh, is fantastic, folks. They are raking in awards right now, 11 of them in 30 days, including Double Gold Grand Reserve in Texas Grand Reserve at the Houston Rodeo, five-time award winner at the San Francisco International Wine Competition, just right outside of Austin. The beautiful Flat Creek Estate is also hosting events for the whole family all spring long, celebrate Easter with live music. And uh, also, of course, we already had Easter, but they celebrated there as well. Uh, you can take in the Eclipse, though. We we're just talking about that. Take in the Eclipse with a bottle in hand as well. And their winemakers dinner on April 11th is the perfect date night, uh, no matter what the occasion. And you can eat, drink, and be awesome at Flat Creek Estate. For more info, please visit Flat 
flatcreekestate.com. That's flatcreekestate.com uh, for more information about all the different festivities and all the events going on at Flat Creek Estate Winery. Really appreciate their uh, support. And I would encourage anyone now that uh, spring is upon us, the weather is really, really nice. Things are starting to cool off a little bit. Flat Creek Estate Winery, perfect place uh, to go spend a uh, staycation, uh, also a date night or a date evening. I plan on actually taking the wifey out there as soon as I can to Flat Creek Estate Winery. So appreciate them and all their support. Uh, also, I want to remind folks, uh, big news, Longhorns, we're excited to be working with Autograph, co-founded by the GOAT himself, Tom Brady. Autograph is where real Texas fans get unreal rewards. It's the first app to track and reward fans for loving what they love most, turning passion into access and experiences founded on the belief that devotion should be rewarded and the future of fandom belongs to the fans. They've been sending true fans to the biggest games in college basketball for just $16. Yes, $16, folks. So as we gear up for football season, this means you can score discounted tickets to marquee matchups, scan to download the free autograph app in the Apple App Store and use the referral code on Texas. That's on Texas. Texas as a referral code, and you can see where your fandom will take you. So thank you to Autograph and the Autograph app. Go check that out as well. All right, let's get into kind of our first discussion. And trust me, folks, we'll get to some of the questions. So keep them coming. We'll appreciate uh, all of the our participation in the show. Let's get to our first topic because I want to get into this ESPN rankings. Um, they haven't ranked every position, so I don't know exactly what order they're going in, uh, but they have ranked a lot of them. Uh, they, they started at wide receiver. That's one of the first ones that I saw. Um, then I kind of went back and tried to find as many of these rankings as I could. Um, but they, they ranked the best pass catchers. So it's not even wide receivers. It's the best pass catchers in college football for the 2024 season. And the Longhorns, uh, they are represented. Number 10 on this list is Isaiah Bond. Uh, the transfer from Alabama, uh, number number one on the list, Luther Burden, the third. I find two things interesting about the list. Uh, number one, the Longhorns do get some love with Isaiah Bond on that list. Uh, but I think something also that's interesting is the Longhorns don't really have to play many uh, elite wide receivers on this list. I think the only pass catcher they'll play is Colston Loveland. He's a tight end from Michigan. He's number eight on the list. So I will say in terms of your favorable schedule, you do avoid any big time wide receiving threats uh, for the DBs. You could make the case. And I think we talked about this. Uh, AJJ Sports might have asked a question and maybe earlier uh, this week or maybe last week on one of our live streams, you know, what's the best wide receiver that Texas is going to face in the SEC, well, it, the best wide receiver they face may be in practice most of the time because they're not really facing uh, any of these guys, uh, the top receivers in the SEC or any of the top receivers really in the country uh, coming up on their schedule. Yeah, I think it's interesting. You know, there might not be some of those big names that you see right now on this list on the Texas schedule, but they'll certainly be facing some really talented wide receivers this year. Uh, you look at, obviously, Colson Loveland at Michigan. He's probably the He's the only one on this list at the moment, uh, but you know, Barrian Brown at Kentucky, he's going to give some people some uh, some some reason to worry. Uh, Jabbar, Mah or uh, sorry, uh, the A and M wide receiver, really talented out there. Uh, Georgia's going to have their guys, and then you look at what Oklahoma has as well. You know, with uh, Nick Anderson, Andrew Anthony coming back, uh, Deion Burks coming in from from Purdue. They've got a, a slew of wide receivers right now that you could look at and really think, all right. You know, this group can really hang amongst the best in the SEC at the moment. So, uh, yeah, it's great that, you know, Terrence Brooks, Malik Muhammad, uh, even Gavin Holmes, you know, they got that run last year against A.D. Mitchell and and uh, Xavier Worthy in practice. Because, again, going into the SEC, you're going to see these guys on a weekend, week out basis compared to maybe the one off against uh, a high flying you know, wide receiver at Oklahoma State, you take a week or two off against Kansas State or Iowa State if they don't have Xavier Hutchinson. And then you get a couple of weeks to relax and prepare for an Oklahoma or even you know a TCU if they've got some guys again. But this year you're going to be up against those type of dudes every single week. Looking at this list right now, Texas is probably pretty fortunate the way that the schedule shaped out. But uh, yeah, they'll be tested regardless. Yeah, thoughts. Uh, Coach, what are your thoughts about uh, Isaiah Bond making a list? Should he be higher on this list, uh, in your opinion, Isaiah Bond? Or 
Uh, is this a, is this someone that held at, for Longhorns? We're not even sure if he's going to be the number one wide receiver. It, most people expect him to be, but you know, Jonte Cook could end up being that guy. Uh, is your thought that Isaiah Bond by the end of the season will be a top ten receiver in college football? Well, that's a good question. Uh, I and, and as far as him being rated higher, obviously, if you look up and down this list, you're looking at, you know, it's it's pretty much goes by stats, you know. Um, and so you don't have young guys in there. You don't have guys that, that maybe were uh, split in time or whatever. There's going to be a lot of guys that are going to rise to the top 10 in that top 10 that, that aren't on this list right now. And I would, uh, I would dare say that many of them are going to be from the SEC. Um, you have so much talent in that league. Uh, you're going to, well, well, just look at Isaiah Bond. I mean, look, he, he only had four touchdowns last year. But he was a very dynamic receiver. Uh, he just had a lot of good receivers around him as well. And uh, I, I think you're going to see that that change up. But looking at stats, I'm, it's, 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 it's about what I thought it would be. Uh, and, and like you said, a really good point, Rod. We don't know that Isaiah is going to be our number one guy. We, you know, we, you know when you look at uh, Matthew Golden and Silas Bolden and Chante Cook and some of the other guys, there, there could be – there could be another couple of guys squeeze into squeeze into. I, I don't know about this top ten, but you know, again, it goes by stats, and stats don't always mean you're winning football games. No, I agree with that. I think was if anything hurts Isaiah Bond, it'll be a first uh, world problem for Longhorn fans. I think you may get so much distribution of the targets because maybe Sark does expand his rotation of wide receivers. The beauty of it is I, I, out of all of these, these receivers that you're looking at, um, you know, I, Isaiah Bond may be among the deepest of wide receiving cores out of all of these guys. I would, I would have bet that he is among one of the deepest wide receiving cores, which means, yeah, you're going to be splitting targets with a lot of other capable uh, explosive wide receivers. So that's a good thing um, for Texas. I do think Isaiah Bond's going to have a specific role. Um, they also brought up the fact that he was a, a 100 and 200 meter uh, state uh, title, uh, state title champ in the track and field because he can run. He can run, run. Uh, Sark likes speed demons. So it's uh, a lot of people believe, and I think rightfully so, that he's basically going to take on that Xavier Worthy role as being the guy that can do everything within the offense. And, and other other players will be playing roles within a passing offense, but Isaiah Bond will be the one that kind of mixes and matches so that he can hunt matchups all throughout uh, the offense. So I, uh, it, it's a safe bet that Isaiah Bond is going to be uh, the top receiver for Texas. But I will say the, with the way Jonte Cook is getting a lot of love and compliments, um, Jonte Cook could end up uh, at, at least taking a lot of those targets away from Isaiah Bond. So maybe he doesn't have the prolific numbers, but he's still Texas' number one guy. Yeah, it's interesting the way that he's kind of ranked at the moment at number 10. Hey, he's doing this on – or he was ranked here off, uh, off of just 64 targets a year ago. You know, that Alabama offense was not one that we've seen, you know, similarly to Steve Sarkeesian. That It's pretty different there. Uh, you look back at what Xavier Worthy's done at Texas, a lot of those three straight seasons over 100 targets. Uh, he had 103 this past season, 67 receptions for 888 yards. Uh, A.D. Mitchell, as the number two for Texas, had more targets a year ago than Isaiah Bond. So, yeah, this is probably a good starting point, but this also is the reason why Isaiah Bond came to Texas is because he knows that he's an NFL caliber draft pick, and he knows that he needs to be uh, paired up with a quarterback that can get him the ball down the field consistently. I think that was one of the biggest issues with – Jalen Milrow a year ago, although he had great deep ball numbers, yeah. couldn't necessarily find the guys in between that 8 to 15 to 20 yard range like we've seen, seen Quinn Ewers do so consistently and so well during his time at Texas. So that, that you know, stat sheet, that stat line right there that you're looking at, that's going to look completely different after a year in Sarkeesian's offense, especially mm -hmm. with Quinn Ewers throwing him the rock. A year yeah, no doubt. Quinn Ewers. Yeah. No, I agree with that. It is a wide receiver friendly offense. All right, um, all right. Moving on from the uh, the wide receivers, uh, I want to get into. I, we can just jump to the other side of the ball. I think it's interesting. They also did pass rushers 
uh, and the elite pass rushers for the 2024 season. Longhorns got some love here as well, uh, the top 10 pass rushers, uh, and actually a lot higher of a ranking than uh, my man Isaiah Bond got with the wide with the pass catchers, I should say. Trey Moore ranked as the number three pass rusher um, for the 2024 season via the ESPN rankings. Uh, a lot of uh, guys who are going to play on Sundays on this list, <laughs> uh, and Trey Moore makes it as the number three overall pass rusher. Uh, they bring up the fact that he's been prolific already um, at UTSA. He's been really productive, and that should translate for Texas. We've talked about how impressive he been, he's been so far. Sark is really complimentary of Trey Moore in the way he carries himself. Uh, just his work ethic, his professionalism seems to be one of those guys is already going to be kind of a, a natural leader uh, when he steps on campus. Um, can he be the natural pass rusher the Longhorns have been lacking for the last three or four years? Uh, looks like Trey Moore nationally is getting that same love that he's getting here locally. Um, what are your thoughts, Coach, about Trey Moore? Is he a top, they're saying, five pass rusher? In the country, does he got that kind? Does he have that kind of ceiling with the Longhorns? Well, I think uh, he sure might. I mean, look at you know you you talking about stats. I mean, you know, look at those stats. There's nobody close to him. You know, 17 and a half tackles for loss, 14 sacks. Closest guy to him is 11. You know, sacks are hard to come by. People don't they just don't realize how hard it is to get a sack. You know. Um, so I think I think uh, I think that's a good spot for Trey. I think he's, you know, we haven't talked about him. I haven't talked about him probably enough just because I haven't laid eyes on him, you know, and 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 seen what he can do. But but I I think um, you know when you look at new guys we have coming in, he's certainly one that has has put up some numbers where he's been not quite obviously the competition he's going to be going against. But he's going to be surrounded by some great teammates as well. Uh, I would say pretty safe to say better teammates around him than he had at, at UTSA, although they certainly had a great season. But I wouldn't leave out, um, you know, uh, so, some of the new guys that we have coming in, as, as, as well as, you know, some of our returners. But uh, Trey, Trey seems to have a, a knack of getting to the quarterback. And so I'm proud to see him there at number three. Yeah, Rod, I'll tell you this. If, if Trey Moore does end up being the number three or even a top five guy in the country off the edge, it changes the entire complexion of what this defense can be. It mm-hmm. We've seen it in individual years over the past, you know, five, mm-hmm. seven, eight years where a guy like Joseph Osai or a guy like Charles O'Minihue can completely flip what otherwise might have been a pretty middle of the pack to below average defense into – all right, now that I know that he's on the field, we have a chance to make a game-winning play. We have a chance to create turnovers consistently. We know that de- uh, opposing offenses are going to have to look at him across that side of the ball and say, yeah, we've got to we've got to find a way to block this guy with more than just one guy. Uh, Alabama's had this, this uh, I guess, luxury for years. You know, Texas coming into that game in Austin, was, how, how are you going to block Will Anderson? Well, you're after. How is it going to be Dallas Turner? Like, how are these guys going to be game plan and schemed against so that your offense can still run smoothly without giving up too much to block and keep those guys, you know, away from your quarterback? If Trey Trey Moore is able to become that guy for Texas, well, now you're looking at the opposite end of a guy either like Baron uh, Ethan Burke, Baron Sorrell, Colin Simmons, Colton Vosick. These guys will be able to eat just as much because of their, you know, continual slide to what Trey Moore brings off the other side of the edge. So it's going to be big. That'll be a big question mark and a big luxury for Texas if Trey Moore is able to live up to this billing. They also on here, guys, had the others receiving votes category for the best pass rushers in 2024. And I, it, we've talked about how Texas seems to have an advantage on the edges and their edges seem more impressive than ever before. So uh, in these also receiving votes category, they have Anthony Hill getting votes. He gets 10 uh, and also receiving votes. They have Baron Sorrell also among the also receiving votes in this category for Texas. And now Anthony Hill's not even officially on the edge, 
but they, they, this is pass rushers. So I guess looking at pass rushing stats, he is, as Sark said, one of your top two best pass rushers. So they got him uh, as also receiving votes and they got Baron Sorrell. And we've talked about how even we don't appreciate Baron Sorrell, maybe in his development. Uh, Ethan Burke is another guy. So even in this ranking by ESPN, there seems to be uh, some love uh, for the Texas edges or at least the Texas pass rush off the edge that it's going to be something that improves drastically. You're going to see it become more of, a, of an impact position that can make those splash plays. So uh, we're not the only ones giving the Longhorns some love locally. Nationally, the edges are getting some love too, Coach. Yeah, and they need to get they need to get a little bit because uh, I, I think uh, CJ made a great point. If Trey does come in his in the top five uh, of, of the pass rushes in twenty four, it does change everything about our defense and makes us much more multiple, and en enables us to move a guy like like Hill around a little bit and um, and and give those guys inside a little a little. Uh, a little help, you know, because they're going to have to start focusing on the edge rushers. Then you've got, you know, there's a guy that, that, uh, you know, Sevilla is a guy that I, that I really want to see. I mean, he's not going to be in the, the sack lead uh, conversation much as a nose guard, but, but he's a guy that could certainly benefit from Trey Moore having a big year a, along with all those guys inside. Definitely. I, I'm with you. I think of Alfred Collins when, he's no longer going to be warranting those double teams. You know, he's a guy that's a mismatch on the interior, not your prototypical, you know, one technique or zero technique guy, but at 6'6", 325, he certainly has the athleticism that we've seen so far on the 40 acres that would translate toward getting after the quarterback very well and very consistently. If he's the third option for an offensive line to look at and say, oh, now how do we block this guy as well? Again, you're looking at, at a defensive line that should continually rack up pressures that we've seen over the past couple of years, this time with more success getting home to the quarterback. Yeah, and no, I totally agree. And like I said, really interested to see what they do with Anthony Hill coming, <laughs> off, coming off the edge because he was he was such an effective weapon uh, coming off the edge for Texas. I, I got this stat actually from Pro Football Focus. They said um, that Anthony Hill – um, that he tied for the fifth among Big 12 linebackers with 18 pressures, uh, also had 15 coverage stops, which was second among uh, Big 12 linebackers. <laughs> um, That's pretty good for a, a part-time edge rusher, part-time part blitzer in yeah. general. <laughs> that's really exactly. good. Uh, that's, that's really, really good. So if you start to extrapolate that, you can start to – uh, get an idea of what that guy can do off the edge. All right, so, yeah, that's a good conversation. Let's go to, uh, Matthew, the defensive backs, uh, because ESPN also ranked what they believe are the top 10 defensive backs in all of college football for the 2024 season. Longhorn's getting some love here as well. Um, and I thought he, I thought this was really interesting, too. Um, ESPN had uh, Andrew McCuba getting love he gets uh not the obviously the longhorns transfer portal acquisition he gets ranked as the number nine this is db so the safeties and corners the way they rank it um they got andrew makuba as the ninth best defensive back uh in the country for the 2024 season this guy that was really really active for clemson i remember dabble swinney saying he can play any position in our secondary he can play safety play corner play nickel uh, and i think he pretty much did play any position in secondary form uh he's is a great open field tackler guys played at a really high level started at a really high level for a long time with clemson um there's not a real big weakness in his game it's not like a tragic flaw in his game of any kind i mean he's really well rounded uh for texas he could play any position they need him to and he's gonna start at safety for him um or just rotate in that safety position for him uh but andrew makuba being ranked as a top 10 db also i feel like you cj if this is the case if he's playing at that high level um, and I expect Jade Barron to also, by the way, Jade Barron was in the receiving votes category. He got two in the receiving votes. So he's got a little bit of love here. But if you got those two guys playing at a really, really high level um, and you get the consistency of Michael Taft and the expected growth on the outside with the corners, that secondary probably could be the strength uh, that we talk, we've talked about or be a strength, I should say for that Texas defense next season if Andrew McCoop is playing at that high level. Because then you're talking about having how many NFL players drafted out of that secondary next year. 
two. You'd have Makuba and Jade Barron, both drafted out of the secondary. I mean, that would be a a hell of a, an accomplishment for a Texas secondary that really hadn't had that much high level talent back there in a long time. Yeah, it's actually it's funny because you could have two this year, but how many of them on the roster right now don't get drafted might be the even better conversation. Uh, that's how much this room kind of flipped on its head, even from what about four or five months ago. Uh, Makuba coming in really just again, he's that Swiss Army knife that you can throw anywhere on that defense because he's done it before. He's been successful as a nickel. He's been an, a freshman All American as a as a field safety as well. Now you kind of throw him in that box role, and you're like, all right, if we need you to play deep center fielder, you can do it. If we need you to play up near the line of scrimmage opposite the Jada Baron, hey, you can do that too. We've seen you do it on tape, and uh, I mean, a, a tremendous addition to this. Uh, secondary for the Longhorns. If there's one question mark with Andrew Makuba, he's only in about a 188, 189 pounds. It's kind of, you know, is that a question mark in the in the SEC? It wasn't necessarily too much of an issue in the ACC, but again, a bit bit of a different uh, play style here. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is, hey, Texas, uh, you know, while they didn't have to play most of those top ten wide receivers, they're going to be facing some really good cornerbacks and defensive backs this year. Yeah. Malachi Starks coming into Austin. Texas going to go face Will Johnson, who was the defensive MVP mm-hmm. of the national championship. Probably, and I, I think I would give him the edge over Travis Hunter as the best cornerback in the country. Uh, Will Johnson is incredible. If you've not watched him, go check him out as a freshman last year at Michigan. Uh, the other thing, Jabbar Muhammad at 10. You know, that was a recruitment that came down yeah. to Texas, Oregon, uh, Alabama messed around a little bit in there as well. Uh, you know, that's, that's one that Texas as a result of having good depth, you know, yeah. might not hurt them a whole lot right now, but eh, maybe, maybe one that you look back on later on and thinking, man, you know, that, that would have been nice to have, you know? Yeah. Two top 10 DBs on this list you'd have had uh, in your secondary that would have been pretty badass for Texas to brag about. But I will say Texas, I think, is in a really good spot. I will say this uh, before I give the floor to Coach. Travis Hunter, top 10 on both the lists. Yeah, I <laughs> and, saw that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they got it as a top 10 wide out and a top 10 DB. Honestly, I, I, I probably wouldn't disagree with that, man. He is a, a magnificent talent. Uh, Coach, what are your thoughts? Uh, Andrew McCuba as a top 10 uh, defensive back in the country. I know Jade Barron wants to be in that Thorpe Award conversation. That's why he's wearing the number seven now, which is Huff Daddy's number. Uh, Andrew McCuba, you think you can have two uh, DBs potentially uh, being, I don't know, a semifinalist for the Jim Thorpe Award? Do Texas have that kind of secondary next season? I, I do. I, I think that's a I think that's a possibility. Again, we talk about this a lot. If they stay healthy, you know, but I, I love uh Jade and and the chip he has on his shoulder to be one of those guys. And then, you know, uh, I think Malik Muhammad has a chance to really spread his wings and grow and develop uh, even more. Uh but I, I, I think you could see two possible in that top ten if we can stay healthy. Uh, but it's uh, it's good to have a guy like Makuba who can who can play everywhere. And if, and if he really does play at the level that we're hoping he's going to play, it'll do the exact same thing that we were talking about with our defensive front. You know, yep. if we if we have a guy that'll come through like Makuba, we're hoping will come through. It's really going to open some things up for us in the secondary to be able to to be able to do some things with a guy we can move around that we that we really haven't been able to do in a number of seasons, in my opinion. Yeah, no, you're right. Uh, they, they haven't been this versatile, and, and you probably got to go back to when you had guys like you know Kenny Vaccaro in that secondary, uh, Quandre Diggs in that secondary, Agent Phillips. They were really versatile then. Um, Makuba's yes. gonna bring a ton of versatility. Jade's gonna be really versatile. Uh, so that is a, I think, uh, gonna be a plus for him in that secondary. So there you go. I mean, uh, ESPN believes that Andrew Makuba uh, could be one of the best defensive backs in the country. Uh, that'd be a huge get for Texas. And yeah, no, I mean, you got those other guys. I love what you brought up, CJ. The younger guy at this point, if you just look at guys you believe will play on Sundays, who have a Sunday skill set now in the secondary, Makuba, Jade Barron. We all think Manny Muhammad's got that kind of ceiling. Uh, you think Ter- we all believe Terrence Brooks has that got that kind of ceiling as well. I mean, that's that's you, you talk about having, you know, four guys in your secondary with NFL ceilings. Um, and, you know, I think you know, I guess you, Derek Williams, another guy. So you got five guys in that in that secondary 
who you believe are going to play on Sundays one day. And that should be ultimately, you know, your goal as you upgrade and churn out the roster. Guys with Sunday skill sets, do, do they ultimately, when they hit their ceiling, are they going to play on Sundays? And it looks like in the secondary, the way they're rebuilding it, that's right now, it looks like that's the focus. They got that kind of, those kind of high ceiling guys or high level players right now in the secondary. Um, yeah. All right. Yeah. So go ahead. No, I was going to say, we haven't even mentioned, you know, Xavier Phil Smee, Kobe Black, you know, Santana no. Wilson coming in in the summer with the NFL pedigree there. There's a lot of continual talent coming in. And yeah. It should only raise the level of expectation and play that we ex that we should see on the field this fall. Yeah, agreed. Um, all right. Thank you, Matthew, for that one. All right. Um, last but not least, I believe they also ranked the quarterbacks. Now, this one was older. They did this one earlier. This might have been the first one they actually did when they ranked the quarterbacks. So they believe are the top 10 quarterbacks coming out. or not coming out, but the, for the 2024 college football season. And uh, Coyne, of course, got some love as well. He should. Um, he is one of the better quarterbacks uh, in the country. Um, but uh, Carson Beck got love to be the top QB uh, on the ESPN top quarterback rankings for the 2024 college football season. Dylan Gabriel, number two, Longhorns know him very well. Got a chance to see him last season versus Oklahoma. Uh, and then Quinn Ewers uh, ranked number three. They also know number four on this list, Jalen Murrow, really well. Uh, saw him last season. Um, but Quinn Ewers, number three on this list, ahead of Jalen Murrow, um, ahead of the Arizona quarterback, uh, Noah Fafita, also Jackson Dart at Ole Miss, Jalen Daniels at Kansas, uh, Shadir Sanders makes it at eight, uh, Cam Rising at nine, and then Cam Ward makes it uh, at number 10. Uh, Carson Beck at number one, we, you've been, we've been talking about it, CJ. Uh, are the Longhorns going to play any of these these uh, elite players on their 2024 schedule uh, where they'll play what is deemed to be the most elite quarterback in the 2024 season, uh, Carson Beck. That'll be an old fashioned quarterback duel. Uh, that'll be kind of a, yeah, that'll be kind of a quarterback shootout between Queen Ewers and Carson Beck. One, I'm sure the NFL scouts are going to be salivating over all the prospects. Oh, both yeah. Of those prospects. yeah. But both of those quarterbacks, I mean, potentially, uh, you're talking about both of those guys uh, dueling it out uh, over who's going to be uh, the top quarterback coming out potentially. Yeah, I mean, if there's any more reason to get excited about Georgia coming to DKR, I mean, you're probably looking at the two best quarterbacks in the entire country. You know, that was a, a game in which yeah. didn't need more expectations or hype surrounding it, but here we are. I, I don't think Dylan Gabriel is a better quarterback than Quinn Ewers. The numbers might echo that uh, or might, you know, differ from that a little bit, but we saw Dylan Gabriel last year at, at Oklahoma, uh, where if you take away that final drive against Texas, what was something that he could lean his hat on as a, a super bright spot right now? I don't think there was a whole lot of them uh, against Colorado or uh, against UCF or Cincinnati, excuse me, on the road, Oklahoma struggled against BYU. He was not having a good game before he got hurt. Uh, SMU for three quarters, you could look at it and say, yeah, this was not a good game all around for the Oklahoma offense. And all of a sudden now we're looking at the number two overall quarterback in the country going to a brand new system with a brand new slate of wide receivers uh, and a brand new conference right now. I don't agree with that, but Hey, that same argument to an extent could happen for Quinn going to the sec. So uh, we'll see right now. I think that Oregon and, and Texas are lining up similarly to what they have at the wide receiver spot. Obviously, you know, Oregon has a, a, a great deal of talent at that position. And then they add Evan Stewart, who was dinged up a little bit uh, a year ago with Texas A&M. But, hey, really talented group. I am not sure Dylan Gabriel is going to have the year that we saw for Bo Nix. And that would really kind of be that one argument I could see in terms of, yeah, he would have a better year than Quinn. Right now, I think Quinn's your number two guy behind Carson Beck, uh, I think, you know, the argument for three, four, five, you could put it anyway with Jackson Dart kind of coming in as well. Uh, Noah Fafita is an interesting one to me because, I mean, what we saw from him towards the back half of last season, especially in that bowl game against Oklahoma, this is a guy that looks like he could make some serious noise, especially with McMillan returning uh, for the Wildcats. For, yeah, for the Wildcats. That could certainly be a team uh, that, that I could see make some noise on a national scale in the Big 12. Yeah. Uh, but for me, it's Beck, Ewers, and then after that, whoever, whoever. I mean, the, it's one, two, and then figure it out. Your argument for Ewers, I think, is is 
advanced, I should say, by the, the, the supporting cast. Like, I would support your argument just because of the supporting cast of Quinn Ewers. I believe, and I, I haven't, like, Georgia, I'm sure they're stacked, but right now Quinn Ewers may have a better supporting cast. At least he's got, you go look at overall, now Georgia stacking running backs, but I'm looking at the wide receivers that he's throwing to. I'm looking at the offensive line. Now Georgia's offensive line is loaded too, but I wonder if there's a slight advantage for Quinn because of the uh, weapons that he has overall. Um, now that Georgia is replacing a lot of their weapons on offense, Brock Bowers out of there, um, the wide receiver, what is his name? Uh, Vlad uh, McConkey. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, he's uh, he's gone. And I, I they have talent, of course, but like Texas at times, unproven commodities that have to prove themselves. Texas brought in proven commodities via the transfer portal that may give them a slight advantage in that uh, that quarterback faceoff coming up early uh, 2024 for Texas uh, in that Georgia matchup. Coach, what are your thoughts about Quinn Ewers, top three quarterback in the country? You think that's if that's the case, he's going to be in New York as a Heisman finalist. Is that going to be the case for Quinn in 2024? Yeah, I think so. Again, you know, knock on wood, we got to we got to stay healthy. I, I, I think Jackson Dart should be a little higher in this, uh, you know, especially in, in that offense and, you know, with the coaching staff they have, uh, he, he's got as impressive numbers as, as anybody, you know, and he's, and he's, I, I don't know that he's, he's at the level that Beck is at or Hewers, but he's, he's really close and, and could be in that top three. I think the interesting thing to me is I look at this, you know, being on staff and recruiting Quinn and Jalen and Cam rising, all those guys were, of course, uh, Cam and, and, you know, Cam was, was on campus for a couple of years, you know, before mm-hmm. he transferred. Yeah. And um, uh, Cam Rising is a guy who was doing great things. Of course, didn't get to play last year because of, uh, you know, injuries. But uh, I don't have any idea what kind of uh, receiver receiving core that Utah has coming back. But if they have a talented receiving core, Cam Rising certainly has the arm and he has uh, – the aura about him to uh, to make some great plays, but I, I don't see uh, I don't see he or Jackson topping Quinn. Uh, I, I I agree with CJ. I, I would I would put Quinn at number two. I don't know. You can't argue with uh, Carson Beck uh, a lot. Uh, he's he's certainly the guy that you got to knock off the top, and we'll we'll have a chance to do that at DKR. So that will be a great quarterback battle, and one of those two guys will uh, come out of that game, I think, in the lead for the Heisman. Yeah. Hey, hey Rod, uh, Daniel has a good question. Uh, that Nate comment is tremendous, by the way. But Daniel has a good question well, about Brian. 28 touchdowns for Quinn Ewers this year. Had 22 last year in 14 games. Not great. Had six games of only one touchdown. But you look at the red zone struggles and you look at 33 field goal attempts for – Burt Auburn, which led the country, I might add, year three now with what is expected to be uh, another, you know, super talented group of wide receivers and tight ends. What are your thoughts on 28 touchdowns for Quinn? Because I'm leaning the over and I'm thinking he gets into the 30s. That is good Um, because it it does depend on what they do in the red zone. Do they throw in the red zone or do they run when they get in the red zone? Are they going to lean into that offensive line and play bully ball? Are they going to trust Quinn to be able to get through his progressions quicker and make uh, quicker decisions and be someone that can kind of expedite his progressions through the pocket in the red zone because everything happens faster and the windows are so much smaller? Um, That is good. I I think if we're projecting that he's going to end up being a Heisman finalist and he's going to end up being one of the top quarterbacks taken, if not the best quarterback taken, then he got to go over. Absolutely. if he's under, then I think we can safely assume that either he regressed or he did not take the leap that we anticipated. So I'm going to go over there, Daniel, because we are hyping up Quinn as someone who is going to be in the conversation to be the top quarterback taken overall. If that is the case, then he's got to improve, not exponentially, but improve along the same lines he did from year one here at Texas to year two. And then year two to year three, I'm gonna say yes. I'll take the over. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm with you, Coach. You, what do you what do you think there? Yeah, I I, I go with the over too. I, I I also wonder what Sark 
and other head coaches that have quarterbacks that are in the Heisman running. Um, you know, I, I, I just wonder sometimes if it's, you know, you got the ball on the five yard line, first down, whatever, three yard line, you know, you give the guy an easy uh, touchdown pass, kind of not pad his stats, but, you know, leave him in the game, maybe a little bit longer, maybe throw it when you could run it. Uh, if you have a high percentage pass and, you know, get his stats up there because it's, as we all know, the, the, the hype that you get from being a Heisman finalist, especially winning the Heisman, uh, can have uh, years and years of effect in your recruiting. Uh, you know, look, look at what it look at what it's done for Riley. I mean, it's it's been Lincoln has done. Uh, you know, with what he did with the guys that transferred into OU, um, he's now all of a sudden he's the, he's the guru. You know, of, of quarterbacks, and I would like to see Sark. Uh, you know, go ahead and and use him and. Not pad his stats, but you know it, it. It sure would do a whole lot for the university if he's in New York for the Heisman finalist, and if he wins it, it's big Even time, right. big time for our program. Yeah, coach, it's not padding your stats. It's called finding a rhythm, isn't it? Isn't that what yeah, yeah. Right? <laughs> That's the phrase. It's all about the spin, baby. It's all about how you spin it. Find the <laughs> rhythm. It. <laughs> yeah, there you go. That's exactly right. Uh, but no, I agree. I agree with Coach 100%. I, I'm sure maybe subconsciously that uh, Sark, listen, it, it works out for everybody. If Quinn go, is a Heisman finalist and is drafted really high, uh, that's going to help recruiting. That's going to help the brand of Texas. Uh, Quinn wins. Everybody wins if he's drafted high and he's a Heisman finalist. So yeah, I can see incentive for making that happen. And by the way, you know, that's the the, 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 the reputation that you want for your quarterback room now. That is the same reputation that Lincoln Riley has. And the best quarterbacks in the country want to go there. Um, and they want to study under Lincoln Riley. Um, and I think Sark has that same reputation. It's not, he doesn't have the Heisman Trophy winner necessarily recently. Like uh, Lincoln Riley, his was way back in the day, uh, going from a Carson Palmer back at USC. But here at Texas, maybe he's about to get that, that, that more, more recent notoriety. Um, at the quarterback position that he's long had. But he's got that kind of reputation as well. Uh, so there you go, the qu top quarterbacks in the 2024 season uh, via ESPN, Quinn Ewers ranked as the uh, number three overall prospect. I think the uh, the beauty of it is out of all of these um, rankings and looking at all the different positions that were ranked and Texas getting some love, whether it be the pass rushers, uh, whether we're talking about the defensive backs, uh, whether we're talking about the pass catchers, whether we're talking about quarterbacks, those positions specifically, and all of them, you know, kind of being among the premium positions, Texas is really deep there. Our conversation led us to how Texas is deep at edge rusher. Even they gave props to Baron Sorrell and to a guy like Anthony Hill uh, on that list, along with Trey Moore. Wide receiver, yeah, Isaiah Bond is the 10th ranked wide receiver on that list but we're still debating whether he's going to be the number one wide receiver here, even at Texas because of guys like John Tate cook and whether he's going to put up prolific numbers because you're going to have so many other weapons like Matthew Golden and Silas Bowden and uh, uh, Ryan Wingo. You can throw him out there as well. And then you go look at quarterback. Yeah. Quinn is the guy, but then behind him, a lot of, a lot of Longhorn fans have more uh, excitement and anticipation for the guy behind Quinn. because they believe he's got a higher ceiling than even Quinn does who we're saying is going to potentially be the first quarterback off the board in the draft. That's to me where the excitement really lies for Texas. We're yes. The, the guys that are right now that we're talking about who are getting a lot of recognition on these lists, they're really talented, but then we're talking about the guys behind them being better. <laughs> you're talking about Colin Simmons being, being better than a Trey Moore, uh, Anthony Hill off the edge. You're talking about, um, what about those young DBs? What about a young Derek Williams? And what about a young Malik Muhammad? They're going to be better than a Jade Barron and better than a Makuba and those guys. And Arch Manning is going to be better potentially than a Quinn Ewers, even though he's going to be really good. That's to me the excitement in going down that list and where our conversation went is that how deep Texas is right now um, is something that we just haven't seen in a decade plus. Uh, some, I mean, mid 2000s is as far back as I can remember when Texas was this deep and they were contending for national titles then. Yeah, I, I wanted to answer the question from Horn7. Does the university need to pump Quinn? Listen, if he's in that conversation 
about midway through the year for a Heisman, you know, say they go out and they take down Michigan, uh, they beat Georgia, they beat Oklahoma, whatever it might be, even if he doesn't go three and zero there. We've seen the university do just fine about, you know, I don't want to call it propaganda, but marketing. You know, Tavondre Sweat a year ago, Bijan Robinson is the most athletic and versatile running back a few years ago. You know, they were starting to start turning those wheels a little bit for Jonathan Brooks before his injury as well. So when it comes to the biggest, most recognizable brand in all of sports, they're going to do their part because they've been around the block a few times. And now that they're kind of back in that conversation for the most illustrious award in college football, I don't think they're going to let any stone go unturned when it comes to promoting, advertising, putting Quinn and the Longhorn logo and the Heisman together to get eyeballs uh, and, you know, kind of that agenda out there. We know that Quinn should be, and we believe he will be, in the conversation for a national award of some kind. We're talking Heisman, but, you know, Davey O'Brien, whatever it may be, he should be in that conversation. He should be a finalist for one of those national awards um, if he ends up, you know, reaching our expectation or achieving uh, what we believe he can. Is there anybody else on this team who you believe is good enough to be in the conversation to be a national award candidate? Coach, I'll throw it to you first. And you believe there any other than Quinn, because we already established we believe Quinn is worthy of that conversation. Anybody else on this team you believe is that good? They're worthy of being a national award candidate, potentially. Anybody else in your mind that good? We didn't know Tavondre Sweat was gonna be that good. Turned out he was that damn good. Won the outland. We lose coach. Oh, I think so. Coach is frozen or something. Well, yeah, give it to we, so, Coach will come back to us. What are your thoughts, CJ? I like Kelvin Banks, and I like Kelvin Banks a lot. He's probably the one guy to me that if you were to go, you know, top three or top five across every position on the team, there's no question about where Kelvin Banks stands at the moment nationally. You know, he's that guy that you've seen kind of pegged in that first round for next year. Uh, he's a guy who's already made noise with all the American accolades. Through two years on the 40 acres, I'll go Kelvin Banks this year. Mm. Next year, I think you're looking at a guy like Anthony Hill. Uh, I think you might be looking at a Terrence Brooks, potentially, if he sticks around. But uh, Kelvin Banks, to me, Rod, is is that guy I can look at and say, I feel uh, comfortable and confident yeah. Uh, that we'll see his name in those awards come the end of the year already right now, April 1st. Yeah, that's a good one. That's honestly, that's the even more so than Quinn. You could argue that's a safer bet than the Quinn one because it, it <laughs> might be. It probably yeah, is. No, I, I think it is actually a safer bet. And you know, I think I think Quinn's gonna be in those conversations too. Uh, but those are and those are the two guys that are projected to be first round picks for Texas in the 2025 draft. So that would also make a lot of sense. Uh, the other guy who would probably be in the conversation to be a first round pick might be a, uh, an Isaiah bond, but we just talked about how he may not have the stats. He may have the ability, he may have the film, but he may not have the stats just because we're expecting Sark to have a deeper or at least a more uh, expanded rotation of wide receivers because you're so deep there. All right, coach. Sorry. You got cut off there. I don't know if you was in the middle of your 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 answer or not. I'll give you the floor. If you think um, who you think's a national award candidate potentially on the roster for Texas, not named Quinn Ewers, of course. Yeah, I think I think uh, Cam on the offensive line has an opportunity, possibly. I think our offensive line as a as a unit, yeah, uh, much like, I like yeah, that. Mu- yeah, much like Washington last year. I think maybe as an overall unit. Honestly, I, I don't see anybody else at this point, you know, being uh, a, a real high percentage threat to, you know, to, to walk away with one of those awards. Yeah, um, I like what you said there, too. I wonder if um, I see so, so somebody say Jade, hopefully. I know Jade Barron wants to be in the Thorpe Award candidate conversation. Trust me, as somebody who's a semifinal, it's tough. You need, you need splash plays. You need splash plays, big plays. So in that second there, he started making some splash plays, some big plays, then maybe you'll start getting some promotion. It, 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 with DB, it's as simple as interceptions. You get the interceptions, 
you'll be a Thorpe Award semifinalist and you'll make a final. If you don't get the big interceptions or the interceptions in big games, then you won't be there. Doesn't mean you're not a, a great DB, uh, but that's really kind of the, the focus of the Thorpe Award. So maybe Jade can be in there. Maybe Makuba can be in that category too. But like I said, he didn't make a lot of plays on the ball. You need to make plays on the ball specifically. Uh, I think that yeah. matters. All right. Uh, good conversation there. All right, before we get to some of the questions, and we're also going to come back, and I want to ask you guys about this Matt Miller seven round mock draft. Uh, we got to show some love who uh, to one of our sponsors uh, because they've been so supportive. So I would encourage everybody if you get any time this spring, go check out Flat Creek Estate Winery, folks. It is fantastic. Flat Creek Estate Wine right now uh, is raking in the awards. Eleven of them in thirty days, including double gold, Grand Reserve, and Texas Grand Reserve at the Houston Rodeo, five-time award winner at the San Francisco International Wine Competition. There are select bottles of the wines by Flat Creek Estate, now available at your local specs. Flat Creek Wines blend old world tradition with new world techniques to deliver you a wine experience you never thought possible. Uh, you're ready for a better wine with Flat Creek Estates. So head to your local specs today or visit flatcreekestate.com. That's flatcreekestate.com to get your first taste of award-winning Flat Creek. That's flatcreekestate.com. And we appreciate all of their support. The weather is getting really nice down here in uh, Central Texas and Flat Creek Estate is a great place for you to uh, spend a, a day, maybe a day date, uh, or maybe uh, you want to take in that eclipse with the bottle in hand that's coming up. Uh, Flat Creek will be a great place for that. Also, uh, they host a lot of great events there um, at their facilities. So you can go check that out at flatcreekestate.com. Um, also, while we're uh, thanking our wonderful sponsors, let's not forget Autograph. All right, everybody, we're in the thick of March right now, getting ready uh, to determine the champion of March Madness. Uh, and also spring football is here. Now, let's be real. How many hours do you spend watching, reading, and listening to our coverage of the Longhorns? Hopefully a lot. All right. Think about that for a second and then ask yourself, what if there was a way to get rewarded for doing it? I mean, there are hundreds of credit cards and airline points programs, but what if there was one where you got points just for showing your Texas fandom? Now, let's take it a step further. What if those points earned you opportunities to unlock rewards like $16 tickets to the biggest games on the schedule? Yes, that's what can happen with the Autograph app. So scan to download the free Autograph app in the Apple App Store and use the referral code on Texas. That's the referral code on Texas to see where your fandom can take you. So thank you uh, to the Autograph app as well. All right. Uh, get all your questions in. We'll get a few of those in uh, just really quickly. And I want to get to a little bit later on, get to the uh, Matt Miller seven round mock draft if we have time. Uh, but a couple of uh, random questions here. Uh, I, I like this one from AJJ underscore sports. He says, do you guys think Ant Hill is playing the wrong position? kind of like Michael Parsons. This is a conversation that's being had in the SEC as we speak about Harold Perkins, the fantastic LSU linebacker, and where he should play, and if he should play on the edge, if he should play at the off-ball linebacker spot. Um, we act, and, 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 you know, we were talking to um, uh, Coach Della Torre uh, the other day on one of our live streams who coached Anthony Hill in high school, and he was talking about what a great athlete uh, that he is, and you know, it just got me thinking. I, 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 I believe that you should move him around. I don't believe he should be in one spot. I believe, based on the matchup and based on the situation, he has the football acumen and he has the ability to move him around the chessboard. That can make everybody else's life difficult because then you have other guys who also can move around and adjust to you know his ability and his flexibility. But I think it's worth it because I think he can be weaponized in a better way that in, in that manner. Um, but now what are your thoughts about it, uh, Coach? Do you think that Anthony Hill is being um, being utilized in the correct way, in the in the way that is most going to uh, maximize his skill set? Or do you think right now uh, Texas may be kind of missing the mark there? Well, I think, uh, I, you know, you got to give our staff a little bit of credit. I think they – I think they're going to come up with a way to utilize him. It might not be a position that gives him uh, maybe a, a chance at really big stats, 
but I think they're gonna they're they're gonna put him in a situation that best helps the team. Okay, and that might be opening up, um, you know, maybe for some other people because they're gonna have they're gonna have to know where he is all the time. So when you have a guy like that and you move him around, it, it could be, it could be to help some other guys, you know, be be, be able to get loose and make some plays. But uh, I, I I just have so much faith in our staff. I think they'll have him uh, in the right place. And I think you know with some new faces coming in, we need to see where all the pieces of the puzzle are going to fit. You mm-hmm. know, right now we're not really sure. And I think that's one of the things that. Guys, we've talked about so many times just the versatility of the players. We're trying to we're trying to recruit and put versatile players on the field. And so as we do that, you're going to see some guys that are going to be moving around. And and you know, if they put them in one spot, yeah, it might be it, it, it might be the best place for him, but is it the best place for the team? You know, and that and there there's a difference. There, there is a yeah. difference. And and I think uh you know, I don't know Anthony very well, but I, I I feel like he's the kind of guy that's going to want to do what's best for the team. And it will also help show his versatility to the scouts, you know, because they like that too. And they like a two-for-one guy, you know. Guy mm-hmm. can play off the edge, guy can play linebacker, you know. We've talked about that. Even Malcolm Roach, you know, remember, you, I, I forgot about that, Rod. You brought it up last mm-hmm. week. You know, that was one time we had him playing linebacker. I mean, yeah. you know, there's, there's – uh, you, 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 I, I think you just trust the staff. Know they're going to put him in the right place, and he is a versatile guy, and he can play a lot of different places. Coach, I'm with you 100. You got to move Anthony Hill around. Um, he, he's just too talented to and, and create such a problem anywhere he is on the field. Again, he's one of those guys. We saw it last year when Texas had you know Xavier Worthy, you know, running around. That was that guy that was wearing a different color jersey and scout team, you know, uh, coaches looking around saying, you know, if, if one heads that direction, we've got to have communication across our secondary to say where he is at all times. Zero is kind of like that and will be like that on the defensive side of the ball for the Longhorns. My, my, I kind of have a, an awkward take here because – you know, when you looked early in that non-conference, you know, schedule last year, it was almost better that you didn't know what he was best at. You know, you could just throw him on the field and say, go play football, whether it be at the edge or in the middle. And you saw him be so uh, disruptive, impactful. You know, th- that game against Alabama where he had the sack and a half, or two sacks, whatever it was. He only did that in about 10 snaps off the edge. You know, yep. he was that impactful that quickly against a team like Alabama, which is filled with guys that we know were at top of recruiting rankings, uh, you know, some of the best in the country. So for me, Anthony Hill, and I was kind of praying for it a little bit more in the Sugar Bowl against Washington when Penix was having success maneuvering throughout the pocket. Texas was able to get pressure, but they couldn't get home. They didn't really have a whole lot of hands on the quarterback at times. Yeah. That was where I think Texas kind of got locked a little bit by Mm -hmm. sticking him in the middle of that defense and saying, stay there. You know, that's where you're going now. And I I think if you were to use him a little bit, whether it be lining up directly over the nose or coming off the edge, maybe you get a little bit more of a rush on Michael Penix in that game because Anthony Hill is, you know, a guy that's 6'3 plus, uh, now standing over 240 pounds. So that is certainly the size that you can get away with when you have that quickness and athleticism and strength, don't get me wrong, off of the edge or in the interior, you know, that's that's something you can get away with. I'm hoping, and this is, I think Texas will have seen what happened with Harold Perkins a year ago at LSU when they used him off the edge. He had a five-sack game against Arkansas, and they said, all right, now in, as a sophomore, you're going to be our full-time middle linebacker. He wasn't nearly as impactful. He wasn't even remotely close to the same player that we saw him use uh, or saw him on the field as a true freshman. So I think Texas sees that and there's been enough conversations between Dan Quinn and, uh, and, and, and Pete Kwiatkowski to say, yeah, if you got dogs, let them run because they can find ways to be impactful on the field, regardless of where they originally line up. Uh, no, that's a great point you bring up about Dan Quinn um, because, you know, when they, Started trying to utilize uh, Demarvion Overshown off the edge yep. a little bit. Uh, they uh, they took some some of those concepts uh, from Dan Quinn, and then having Dan Quinn be 
be, uh, you know, obviously a sounding board for, you know, Coach Sark and having him coach, uh, come speak at the coaching clinics. I do think there are some of same those same concepts and ideas that you weaponize with Michael Parsons. You really can take those, and I think you can apply them directly to Anthony Hill. The the one probably the most probably the most um, common concept that Dan Quinn uses to weaponize Mike as a pass rusher from the linebacker position. He'd have him at off ball linebacker. And then he would he would bump him down to Demarcus Lawrence's side, and then bump Demarcus Lawrence inside, and basically have Demarcus Lawrence basically playing tackle, and he's playing the edge. And then sometimes they would just rush like that because that would get you a matchup advantage with Demarcus Lawrence getting a, a much less athletic interior offensive lineman, or which is a nightmare. They would do a twist or a stunt with oh, yeah. Micah there and then get Micah mashed up on some poor schmo of an uh, interior offensive lineman who's trying to figure out how to block that Tasmanian devil. Um, so that was good. Or they would, uh, you know, they would put Micah kind of, as you pointed out, they would kind of have him mugged up in that, in that B gap. He'd be mugged up on that B gap. And then they still run another twist and stunt with him. So he ends up on the edge, uh, have that end come back inside and they they ran a they ran a lot of little funky concepts just to get Micah matched up one on one with a blocker, and then they knew well he's gonna beat the one on one blocker every damn time. We just don't want you to be identified where he is. That way you can double team him, or you can chip him, or you can yep. you know, motion an H back or a tight end over there, and make him run the wide loop around those types of little things to make his life tougher. You just want to just manufacture a one-on-one. I feel like with Anthony Hill, that's all you really got to do too. You can manufacture a one-on-one. He should be able to win that most of the time uh, as a pass rusher because he's so dynamic. So uh, I'm, I, I think you got to move him around. I think it's a really good point there. All right, a couple of questions before we get out of here. We're almost done. Um, let's get to uh, Daniel Earp here. Um, and he's got an in- interesting question. He says, Darian Gallette could be a sleeper this year. Um, what are your thoughts about Darian Gallette? He said he could be a sleeper this year, CJ. Um, is that one of the sleepers that we missed? We went through sleepers earlier on uh, on one of the other shows. Is that a sleeper that we missed? Haven't heard much. I'm, I'm kind of split on Darian Gallette because, first off, he, he's a tremendous athlete. You know, he's 6'3 plus, probably 6'4, I'll give him. Uh, and this was a guy in high school who was anchoring – the four by two. He was he was the final guy in the four by two uh, relay for Marlin High School. I mean, he has tremendous athleticism. Watching him run and watching him dunk a basketball uh, was something that I was just like, yeah, like this this kid needs to find a way onto the field. The question is, where are you going to use him? You know, is it going to be at the edge? Is it going to be at a middle linebacker spot? Uh, right now, he's kind of that tweener spot because he doesn't necessarily have. 260 pounds on him. He doesn't necessarily have 230 pounds on him. You know, where he is and where he fits is a question mark. Uh, I I like the idea of him being uh, kind of that off ball, you know, inside interior guy. I think he has a higher ceiling there, but he made most of his big money from high school coming off the edge because of how athletic and quick Mm -hmm. he was. So uh, I'm a little split on Darren Gallette. Uh, This, the next nine practices, which begin tomorrow for practice number seven uh, is going to be really big for me with uh, Darren Gallette and just how much we'll see of him right now at those spots. Yeah, that's a great point. And he's, I mean, it's crazy. You called him a tweener and I remember, and coach, you probably can uh, attest to this too, because certain terms that used to be negative against players have now been kind of spent and they now um, have, they're the same pretty much meaning and definition, but it's a new trendier term. Like they used to call them tweeners. Even when Tom Herman was here, Tom Herman was calling guys tweeners. He was talking, I remember calling players tweeners in some of the uh, media availabilities. And then now Sark refers to guys as position flex, um, which is the same thing, but it's just a fan. I mean, basically you, you're cooler and basically what it means to me is a tweener means coach. Haven't, he hasn't found a place for you. And if you're position flex, that means I will find a place for you. <laughs> or, or or versatile. He's very versatile. <laughs> He's versatile. He's versatile. Yeah, he used to be a tweener though, right? Remember that was a bad thing, Coach. Remember being a tweener? Yeah. I tell you what, I'm looking forward to him being on the field. Uh, 
you know, get, getting a red shirt year behind him and um, getting on the field. Uh, I've said this before, Rod, you've heard me say it many times, but I love those small town guys. I love those small town guys because they come with a chip on the shoulder. You know, can I really compete here? Can I really, you know, I come from Marlin High School. You know who is one of his coaches, Ramos Taylor. Yep. Oh, yeah. Okay. Our nice. Team. Yeah. yeah. Who, hey, yeah. coach, he was leading the track practices. So if you talk about speed and kind of getting things going, I was Ramon's putting, you know, his fingerprint on a linebacker there. Yeah, yeah. No, no doubt. But but I, I'm really looking forward to seeing him explode onto the scene. I don't know that that he deserves a whole lot of love yet, but I'm really looking forward to seeing him because, uh, you know, you, you, you look at Jordan, you look at Colt McCoy, you look at Quan Cosby, you look at these guys from these small towns, man. They come in and every practice is like the Super Bowl to those guys because they got to prove they belong. You know, they're not those six A guys that Sidir is talking about. You know, they're they're mm -hmm. small two two A three A guys, and it's a it's a it's it's a tough thing mentally and emotionally for those guys to come in. And you know, they're used to you know offensive linemen like five ten 160 pounds at that level. You know, yeah, I can get right past that guy. You know, get to the quarterback. Well, it's a whole different game now, but I love the way. Uh, it works out so many times. It doesn't always work out, but uh, those those small town guys, man, they and I guarantee if RT was coaching him, he's gonna have a chip on his shoulder. Yeah, RT, now, I, I promise you. I spent a lot of time with RT when I was head coach at Belton. He would come up, talk to the team, watch practice, be with us on sidelines. Man, that dude's a gamer. I mean, he he knows nothing but full speed. You know, full speed. And um, so I, I'm really looking forward to seeing uh, seeing seeing this young man from Marlin come in and try to make a name for himself this season. Yeah, yeah, I know uh, coaches like them small town guys. I like them small town girls, coach. That's what I'm <laughs> like. small so town. Where's your wife from now? <laughs> She's from a small town, coach Quarter Lane, Idaho. Small town. From a small go. state. <laughs> like a small town man no doubt uh all right there you go that's a great way to end it always on a nice uh anecdotal note from coach shipley that we appreciate it um all right i want to thank my man matthew behind the scenes because without him none of this will be possible uh he's the reason that we look so professional so we appreciate matthew and all of his hard work we appreciate all you guys your participation uh thank you guys so much for all of the, the chats and the questions and thank you guys for watching it means a lot to us remember we'll be back again thursday Thursday, 4.15 to around 5.30. Uh, we're Mondays and Thursdays with the winning drive. Uh, also, I want to thank uh, the Autograph app. Thank Flat Creek Estate Winery for all of their support as well. Really, really appreciate them. Uh, Coach, uh, any last words for the people before we uh, say goodbye? Well, man, we're in the middle of spring ball. It's a great time. It's a great time to be a Longhorn, man. I, I, I need to get down to Austin and watch a practice or two. Yeah, it is a great time to be a Longhorn. CJ, you got any uh, final thoughts for the people? Hey, happy uh, April Fool's Day to everybody that celebrates. You know, it was a good one. Oh. Hope, don't get got too bad, you know. They yeah, got me. Quandre Diggs retiring. <laughs> I, I, I was telling Rod before he came on the air, I said, man, Rod, what's up? Our, our man Quandre is, is finally retiring. He's an April Fool's coach. It's April. <laughs> I don't even check my messages today. <laughs> I know. I, I gotta. I gotta. I can't even check the the timeline on Twitter. I gotta ignore it all on today. I, I'm sure I'll come back tomorrow and I'll fact check everything else. But on April Fools, I'm too old, man. I get fooled. Actually, it they actually get me. That's how I me know too. I'm the fool. I become the fool on April 4th. I don't like that. Uh, all right. For uh, Coach Bob Shipley, for my man C.J. Vogel, uh, for Matthew behind the scenes, uh, I am Lifetime Longhorn Rod Babers for the On Texas Football family. Until next time, we appreciate you guys and hook them.